Okay, so I'm recording now on this computer and I'm a little worried as to what screen is being shared. You are screen sharing. Currently it is the book and the notepad. Okay, thank you. All right, so um, I had planned uh, to um, drop back to the topic of exact differential equations, but looking at the people who are tuned in, these, the people tuned in seem to be the same people who were tuned in on uh, Wednesday um, of last week before semester break. Um, in that case, maybe it's um, a mistake to go over the material that I went over last Wednesday. Um, so let's see, first, is there anybody who um, is um, uh, listening to the talk but was not here last Wednesday? Let me- uh, I, was, I wasn't here Wednesday. All right, so at least I one don't... person. Okay, all right, so I'll, I'll just go over the stuff from last Wednesday. Maybe I'll go over it a little faster than I would otherwise. Um, so the first topic is to go back to um, exact first order differential equations. And um, this term exact may be unfamiliar, but it's um, a very simple idea. It's that a uh, differential equation is exact if this left-hand side is the differential of some function. In other words, there's some function phi. So the d phi is p dx plus q dy. In other words, that this thing is d phi. And um, if that's the case, then p, of course, has to be the x derivative of phi, and q has to be the y derivative of phi. And so then you have these equations. p is the x derivative of phi, or phi sub x, and q is the y derivative of phi, or phi sub y. And moreover, <clears throat> the the partial two of phi with respect to x partial y is the same thing as partial two phi partial y partial x. And consequently, one has this equation that the y derivative of p, which is the, which is the, is, which is d dy of this has to equal the x derivative of this which is um, the x derivative of Q. So, the con so if an ODE is exact, then um, there's a condition of, uh, the condition of in integrability is that the y derivative of P is the x derivative of Q. Um, so let me say, let me just check something. Okay, so this is the criterion. And um, in particular, if an ODE is separable and separated, so in other words, it's P of X dx plus Q of Y dy, then it's automatically exact because PY vanishes and QX vanishes. Um, but of course, uh, uh, a differential equation can be exact without being separable. And there are various examples here. I think I'm gonna skip the examples Boyle's law, for Boyle's law, this thing, PDV plus VDP is D of PV. And so the equation is, is D of PV equals zero. And um, for um, human population growth, uh, phi is T over B plus one over N 
and d of that is this, and um, that's what we integrate. Um, now, the deeper meaning here is um, that any old first order ODE, which would be of the form P dx plus Q dy, um, we could integrate that, we could integrate P dx plus Q dy along any contour. And we, what would we get? Well, we'd get a function and the function will be a function of the endpoints and of the contour and of course of the differential equation. On the other hand, if the thing is exact, then the, the, this integral is an integral of d phi and an integral of d phi, of course, just depends upon the endpoints. And so instead of getting some integral that involves the contour, we get an integral that involves just the endpoints. And that's equal to phi at the endpoints minus phi at x zero, y zero. And so this is an equation then that we can solve. And um, here were two examples of it. Um, it uh, this example is the abstract in general, sorry about that uh, example. Let me make this bigger so. Uh, it's easier to see. So let's, instead of doing the abstract general case, let me do the uh, specific case. Uh, suppose P dx plus Q dy is log y squared plus one dx plus two y x minus one over y squared plus one dy. By the way, I'm using log to mean natural log throughout this uh, book. Um, I, I, I did use LN when writing the book, but I think that's kind of a, an ugly notation. Um, and also, I mean, it's like, you know, anytime you don't, you mean the natural log, you have to say what the base is. And so you have log sub 10 and it's perfectly clear. Anyway, um, here's a factorized and therefore separable ODE. And um, the reason it's uh, exact is that PY is this and QX is that. And so they're, then they're equal. And so what we do is we integrate P, which is the derivative of phi in the X direction and at some point y. And what we get then is x log y squared plus one plus an unknown function c of y, because we only know the x derivative. But then we know that, that phi sub y is q. So phi sub y is, is um, uh, the y derivative of this and the y derivative of this is well, you differentiate log and you get one over y squared plus one and the derivative of that is two y. And then you get the y derivative of the unknown function c, but you know that that's gotta be equal to um, this thing here, which is two y x minus one over x squared minus x squared plus one. So now we have this equation that this is equal to that. And so CY subtracting, we see that CY is just this. We now integrate that in the Y direction. We get that. And then we put it into this equation for phi. And we get that where D is an unknown constant. We then set, uh, then uh, setting as, in as much as d phi equals zero, we um, set uh, this equal to a constant e, and uh, because d phi vanishes, and um, 
we can rewrite that, of course, as x minus one log that equals f. And that finally is an equation we can solve for y of x. And it's uh, a weird solution. Um, integrating factors. Now, um, with luck or skill or intuition or divine help, one can find an integrating factor sometimes that turns an ordinary differential equation, uh, makes an ordinary differential equation exact. So alpha PDX plus alpha QDY is D phi, and so the thing is integrable. And so what, what, is the pro what are the properties of alpha? Well, alpha P is phi sub X and alpha Q is phi sub Y. And alpha, the, the Y derivative of alpha P is then the Y derivative of phi sub X, which of course has to be the X derivative of phi sub Y or the X derivative of alpha Q. And so we have this equation here. Um, examples of simple integral integrating uh, factors are, uh, we could have y dx minus x dy equals zero. If we choose as alpha one over x squared, we get this expression. Now p is this, q is that, and consequently the uh, conditions of exactness are, are satisfied. A simpler integrating factor is just one over x y. And uh, that then separates the variables. And so we can integrate immediately and get log y over y zero equals log x over x zero. And um, that tells you that uh, log y over x times x zero over y zero is, is zero which means that this thing has to be one. And so y is equal to x times this constant. Um, a concept that's um, very important in physics because it occurs a few times and makes our lives simpler is the idea of a homogeneous function. So homogeneous functions like Dirac delta functions are your friends. Um, so a function of k variables is said to be homogeneous of degree n if f of tx, that is to say tx1, tx2, dot, 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 txk, is t to the n times f of x. And an example is z squared log x over y because here, if you take um, x, y, z and multiply each one by t, the x, y parts cancel. But you have t squared out here. And so indeed, this is homogeneous of degree two. Now, if, if we go back to the original definition that the thing is homogeneous of f, t, x is t to the n, f of x, and we differentiate with respect to t, we get d, d, t, um, is partial tx, partial txi times d txi dt. Well, this is just xi, and this is the partial of f uh, of tx with respect to txi. On the other hand, the derivative of this thing, well, we know if it's homogeneous, f of tx is just t to the n f of x. And so the derivative is n t to the n minus one f of x. So now we have this expression here. Um, and what Euler noticed was, well, set t equal to one, you get a nice juicy formula, namely that the sum of the xi's partial f, partial xi summed gives you n. Now n is the degree of homogeneity, k is the number of variables. And uh, another way of writing that is x dot grad f equals n f. If f of tx equals t to the n f of x, and I should put 
X is uh, vector things there. Um, so uh, here are some examples. The internal energy is a first degree homogeneous function of the entropy, the volume, and the number of particles of each kind. And um, that's, of course, kind of intuitively obvious if you have a system here with a bunch of different kinds of particles and some entropy and some volume, and you just put an identical system next to it, you then have two systems, twice the entropy, and that's, uh, that's, that. that's the case for t equal two, and so you'd get twice the entropy. Um, it turns out that um, the temperature, the pressure, and the chemical potential are all defined in terms of the internal energy by these partial derivatives. And uh, so the change du can be looked at this way. Now Euler's theorem then expresses, since, this, since the internal energy is of homogeneous of degree one, uh, Euler's theorem tells us that S partial U partial S plus V partial U partial V plus NJ partial U partial NJ is U. And uh, then using these equations for the derivatives, we get U is TS minus PV plus uh, mu J and J. Um, incidentally, um, the, the, these equations, of course, are always relevant, um, but um, the, there's been a new twist on them, an unexpected twist on them in uh, cosmology, because what we've found is that the expansion of the universe is actually accelerating, which means that effectively there's a negative pressure. And um, the reason for that is that in some sense, let me switch now maybe to red, the internal energy of the universe, that's internal energy, not universe, um, is uh, some constant, let's call it alpha, times the volume of the universe. So partial u, partial v is, um, alpha, but partial u partial v is minus p. And what we're seeing here is that we can have a negative pressure if the internal energy is proportional to the volume. And so the idea is that empty space has positive energy. And that causes the expansion of the universe to accelerate because you have negative pressure. Um, there's a more speculative, I mean, this, this, this acceleration of the universe has been um, observed. Uh, it was first seen about 23 years ago and looking at supernovas far, far away. Um, and um, they were in fact trying to measure the deceleration of the universe. Everybody was convinced the universe was, that the, that the expanding universe was slowing down and decelerating. So they would wanted to measure it by looking at uh, far away supernovas. And um, uh, so they were just, shocked and they probably checked their work a gazillion times before they um, actually published their result, which is that um, the uh, uh, expansion of the universe is accelerating. Um, some time ago, about well, almost 40 years ago, maybe 35 years ago or so, um, various people, most prominently um, Alan Guth at MIT, um, uh, suggested that in the very early universe, there was um, a period of rapid 
expansion due to a very high negative pressure. And the idea was that the energy density of the universe of some, some, of some small part of the universe for some reason was huge. And that caused a fantastic expansion. If the energy density remove, or, or remained fantastically high and the universe expanded from you know, the size of a nucleus or less to the size of a golf ball, and then all that potential energy was converted to radiation, um, that was the big bang. And um, this then sort of explains um, why it is that uh, the cosmic microwave background radiation is uh, isotropic after you subtract out the, after you correct for the motion of the earth um, or the motion of your satellite that's observing the CMB. Um, now, whether inflation is right or not, we don't know, but um, it's a leading theory. Uh, another theory put forward by a guy at Princeton is that um, the universe uh, existed before the Big Bang and uh, collapsed a big crunch and re-expanded. And that solves the same problems that inflation solves, more or less. There are arguments about that. Um, by the way, there was a mistake in the book. For some reason, I um, was thinking, um, I guess, I guess what I was trying to say was that for, if you had many kinds of particles, you would not have, well, I don't know why I wrote what I did in the book. The reality is that the entropy of an ideal gas of N identical particles is a home, first degree homogeneous function of the internal energy, the volume and the number of particles. And the reason is that if you multiply TU, TV, TN, the T's cancel here, the T's cancel there, and you get one extra T. So it's a degree one homogeneity. Um, this is called the Sakur uh, tetrode formula. Um, why we're writing in terms of H rather than H bar, I don't know. Anyway, one of the important applications of all this is the virial theorem. And um, let me go through that for you because it's so important in physics, um, just ordinary physics, ordinary mechanics, and in cosmology as well. Um, so the virial, this is the non-relativistic virial. Um, if you guys send me um, requests by email, I'll um, try to say something about a relativistic analog uh, tomorrow, but not today. Um, so the non-relativistic virial uh, for n particles in three-dimensional space is the just the dot product of X with P. And so you have a sum of a three N variables here. Well, six N variables, three for X, three for P, three N for X, three N for P. And um, the non-relativistic kinetic energy here is uh, V dot P. And that's just MV squared over two, non-relativistically. The force is PI dot. And so the time derivative of the virial is V I P I plus X I F I. And that gives you this expression here. On the other hand, this virial um, in general, you can't say anything, but um, for stable systems, in which the particles are bound by a potential that keeps the virial bounded. So that, um, I mean, the virial doesn't have to stay constant, but it, it, it's got to some, it's got to go, it's got to be bounded for all time. So what you say then is that the absolute value of G of T less than some number, um, oh God, M say, for all T. 
And if that's the case, then the time average of the derivative of the virial is zero because it's, um, if you take the infinite time average, you have an infinite time and you have two finite numbers, so you get Zippo. And this, of course, then is the time average of the momentum time of the kinetic energy times two plus the time average of this thing. So we have this equation. On the other hand, non-relativistically, Fi is minus the gradient of uh, the potential. And so what we have is this expression here. Now, still, we don't have any actual result, but if the potential is a homogeneous function of degree n, then, aha, uh -huh, Euler points out this is just n times v. And so we get the, the virial theorem, the non-relativistic virial theorem, which is the long-term time average of the kinetic energy for a potential that is homogeneous in the coordinates of degree n is equal to n over two times the long-term time average of the potential energy. And um, this is something that has been, there are many examples of this. Coulomb force is homogeneous of degree minus one because um, for example, if we, switch, we have um, V of R is equal to one over R, but that's one over square root of X squared plus Y squared plus Z squared. And so V of TR, uh, unfortunately T is not the time. I really should be more careful with the notation. This is one over TR and the reason or T minus one one over R or T to the minus one V of R or, and, and the reason is that this is the square root of square root of T squared X squared plus T squared Y squared plus T squared Z squared, which of course then is T to the minus one over R. Okay, well, so for the case of the hydrogen atom, by the way, there's a typo in the book, this should be minus 13.6 EV. Um, what we have is that for, my goodness, where have I been writing? In the middle of, okay, these notes then are completely mixed up. Go. Okay, well, um, what the virial theorem tells us then is T is uh, minus one half time average of V. And um, this thing is P squared over 2M for say an electron. And um, this is then minus a half V well, this is um, uh, equal to uh, the time average of minus E squared over R. And um, so what you get then is that uh, uh, T is uh, minus V over two and um, E is minus 13 point, wow. All right, hold on a second. Minus 13.6 EV, and this is equal to the kinetic energy um, uh, plus the potential energy. And so the kinetic energy is half the potential, is minus half the potential energy. So this is equal to V over two, and that's 13.6. Um, you can actually um, solve for this if you say, well, um, let's um, use the uncertainty principle to go further here. And then you say that, um, so let me maybe change colors for a second here. 
So you say uh, that RP is greater than or equal to one, essentially. And so then and you go further and you just say one over R is P. And so E is equal to P squared over 2M minus E squared P uh, because one over R is P. And, um, and the kinetic energy then is P squared over 2M. And um, well, actually, no, now you minimize this. So you minimize this with respect to P differentiating and you get P over M minus E squared is zero. So P is E squared M. And then you substitute that in for T, P squared over 2M, you get M E to the fourth over two. For the potential energy, you get minus E squared over R, but R is one over P. And so this is minus E squared P or minus M E to the fourth. And uh, since T is minus V over two, this satisfies the Virial theorem. It also lets you compute the um, ground state energy as being uh, minus M E to the fourth over two or effectively, this is a nice way of writing it, minus the rest mass energy times alpha squared, where alpha is one over 137. So E is uh, minus a half. Oh, well, there's actually a two missing here. Minus a half MC squared alpha squared. Um, and so numerically, let's just check that there should be a one half here. Minus a half, this is um, 500,000 electron volts. Alpha is one over 137. You square that, one over 137, right? You square that, you get basically 20,000. And so canceling some of these zeros, you get 25 over two, which is of, of the order of, well, if I had done it exactly, I would have gotten 13.6 EB. So there is a one half that's missing here. Let me, let me um, fix it uh, on the uh, fly here. It's, um, Uh, I'll just put do it this way. Now, uh, Zwicky, a German uh, astronomer, um, was observing galaxies in the Coma cluster of galaxies, and he, back in the 30s, found that. Um, these galaxies were moving much too fast. The kinetic energy was not, um, instead of having kinetic energy as minus a half, well, the mean value of the potential energy, you could compute the potential energy of the gravitational field based on the stars that he could see and the galaxies that he could see and his estimates, which of course were very sophisticated. Um, and he came to the conclusion that there was um, there had to be mass that was not shining that he didn't see, and so he called it dark matter. Um, we now we now think of it as um, uh, transparent matter, and um, not only is it transparent, but it it doesn't seem to interact much with ordinary matter at all. Um, And so this is one of the huge uh, mysteries. Um, what, is, what is the dark matter? And nobody knows. And um, uh, it's, it's, at this point, it's embarrassing um, because uh, this has been going on now for like 90 years, 88 years now we've had uh, dark matter and we don't know what, what it is. 
We also, for the last 23 years, have had uh, an energy density of empty space, which um, uh, has been called dark energy. By the way, the person who called it dark energy is giving a colloquium here, not here, but he's Zooming us a colloquium on Friday. Um, he's one of the leading um, uh, uh, physicists uh, doing uh, cosmology. And he and Kolb, uh, in fact, wrote a uh, book that basically turned out to be the basis of much of the research in cosmology for 20 years or so. Um, I am terrible with names as I've admitted many times and I can't remember this guy's now, Turner, Michael Turner. Um, anyway, he's um, not only a brilliant physicist but he's something of a comedian and, um, and, and he does marvelous slides. Um, so his, his colloquia are entertainments, um, whereas many colloquia, most of them are kind of boring um, and disappointing um, uh, to students. They might be totally puzzling to professors. Uh, uh, professors in the field are bored, except maybe the last five minutes. Professors not in the field are confused and bored throughout the whole talk. Um, whereas with, uh, with Michael Turner, um, people are, are amused and astonished uh, and delighted. He also has remarkable insights. So um, I mean, he's, 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 he's one of the top people. So you should, even if you have no intention of ever looking up, let alone entering astronomy or cosmology or particle physics, uh, you should listen, tune in to this Zoomed colloquium on Friday. Um, harmonic forces uh, have n equals two, and so we get t is to the, the long-term time average of the kinetic energy is the same as that of the potential energy. Um, Another topic here is uh, a transformation that Legendre uh, introduced. Um, and uh, it's basically that the change of function of two variables is X and Y is obviously that. And so what Legendre said, well, suppose we define a new variable as this partial here. And uh, you know, most people wouldn't think of doing that, but he thought of doing it. And so then he, he defined a new function, B as A minus VY. And then he noticed, well, what's DB? Well, DB is partial A partial X, DX plus partial A partial Y, DY. And then over here, it's minus DV times Y minus um, v, which is partial a, partial y, dy. And so now this term cancels that one and you just have b, db is, is something times dx and something times db. And so that suggests that b is in effect a function of x and v. Now to really make it a function of x and v, however, we've got to invert this definition and we have to take y and express it as a function of x and v. And in that, if we can do that, if we can find y of x and v, then we have the equation b of x and v is a of x time, uh, and y of x and v minus v times y of x and v. Um, so that's the basic idea of Legendre transformations. And they're especially useful when this, uh, when the inversion here of the expression of y in terms of x and b is easy. And in ordinary non-relativistic mechanics, in ordinary quantum field theory, free field quantum field theory, anyway, this whole um, area of physics, uh, this inversion is very easy 
and so the the Legendre, Legendre's transform is is very effective. Um, unfortunately, if you have a more complicated Lagrangian, uh, more complicated function, it's not necessarily easy or even possible to to find y as a function of x and b. Anyway, going back to a. Uh, we could also define a new variable u as partial a partial x and then a new function c as a minus ux and then we'd have dc as this and it turns out to be apparently just a function of y and u and this is this is really the case if you can write x as a function of u and y and then you've got C of U and Y equal to A of X of U and Y and Y like that. Or you could define U to be this, V to be that, and you go all the way from A to D. Uh, and then D is a function just of U and V. But again, you have to be able to express U and V in terms of X and Y in order to finish this. And this is, um, the example of um, of uh, the, in mechanics, the functions of Lagrange and, and Hamilton. Um, Lagrangian is typically uh, taken to be a function of Q and Q dot, where Q, uh, sometimes it's just a single variable Q and Q dot. Other times it's Q is, a, is N coordinates or three N coordinates and Q dot is three N coordinates uh, or three N time derivatives. Anyway, the change in DL is given by that and you and the Legendre transformation is to define a new variable P, the momentum as this partial here. And then you define the Hamiltonian as P Q dot minus L. So you do a Legendre transform transformation. And the overall minus sign is just to make H positive in most cases and um, H being an energy. And so then you have DH is P DQ dot plus Q dot DP minus DL. And uh, P is partial L partial Q dot DQ dot. Uh, this is Q dot DP minus DL. Well, DL is partial or partial Q dQ minus partial or partial Q dot dQ dot. And now you have some cancellations. This guy cancels that guy and you have Q dot dP minus partial or partial Q dQ. So that gives, says the Hamiltonian is a function of Q and P. And um, you've all seen that, I hope. Um, if not, study this section. If, you, if this stuff is new to you because um, your teachers were forgot to mention this, then by all means study this section carefully. Um, now, most often L is a, is quadratic in the in in Q dot, so it's like Q dot squared over two or M Q dot squared over two, and then you invert easily uh, the definition because partial L, partial Q dot, it's just Q dot, M Q dot. And uh, so P is just M Q dot. And then you can express Q dot as P over M and you're home free with the Hamiltonian. So this is, for example, is harmonic, a harmonic oscillator. And uh, as I said, P is just M Q dot. You invert that for Hamiltonian, you get this expression. And um, you can also go backwards. You can start with the Hamiltonian and get L. And so then you define Q dot as partial L partial P set L equal to P Q dot minus H. And then you get um, this expression here. Um, so um, there, this is an example with thermodynamic potentials. I. I don't know. Um, I suppose since this is a physics class, um, we ought to maybe go through this. Uh, we've seen that du is TDS minus PDV plus 
the chemical potentials times uh, dnj and number of particles and um so if you want to go from svn to spn you add pv and then you get what's called the enthalpy its differential is that and so the enthalpy depends upon the entropy the pressure and the number of particles you subtract TS from the enthalpy, you get the Gibbs free energy. And then the Gibbs free energy is pressure, temperature, and number of particles. The advantage of this one, by the way, is that um, it's very useful in chemistry, physical chemistry, because it's easy to measure the pressure and the temperature and the number of particles in the solution. It's not so easy to measure um, the entropy of the solution. Okay? So that's um, one of the advantages of the Gibbs free. And this is just one of the many things Gibbs did. Um, the Helmholtz free energy is then U minus TS, and it turns out to be this expression. Um, okay. Now, this is another thing that's more physics than mathematics. Um, on the other hand, there's mathematics buried in this physics and um, the physics is so important that it's, it's good for you guys to see it. Um, it's better for you to see it too many times than not enough times. And so I'm going to go through it. So imagine, and if you've never seen this in class, you need to study this section carefully. So in classical mechanics, you have n particles in three dimensions. You have an action density that's the time integral of the Lagrangian. And um, here in general, as in general, the Lagrangian depends upon time as well as position and momentum. And uh, so the action looks like this. Now, um, the principle of, of, it's called the principle of least action. Um, it's um, purest, call it the principle of stationary action. And the idea is that we want, to, we want to see what kind of trajectories Q of T are such that if you change them just a little bit, the change in the action is essentially um, undetectable. It's second order in the change in the path. So the idea, here, let me sort of visualize this point. Whoops, what did I do here? All right. So, so the idea here, by the way, this S is not entropy, this is action. So you have a process in which that happens. This is Q. So maybe this is, I do not understand why it always goes to eraser. This is T. And this is Q, and really this Q is a vector, it's a 3n vector, something like that. And so the idea is that if you're going from Q0 to some Q of big T, let us say, then the idea is that the, the classical path is the one that changes the action the least. The, whose action changes the least if you make small changes. So in other words, we're going to make a small change here by having another trajectory that looks like that. Now it goes to the same endpoint. So I'm going to get rid of this part there. Um, let me go back to blue and I'm, I don't want to make and exactly the same here and exactly the same there. So the idea here is that uh, the change in S is proportional to the change in this squared or the integral. It's proportional to the time integral of the square of the change of the um, uh, path, of the coordinates of the path. And um, to see what that 
implies we just do it. We say, well, all right, the change in the action then is going to be a sum here over all the coordinates, change in each coordinate, partial of L, partial QI, partial of L of Q and Q dot and T partial QI dot, change in QI dot. Now, the change in QI dot can be confusing. And so let's just see what it is. The change in QI dot is the time derivative, the changed time derivative, which is the time derivative of Q plus delta Q minus the ordinary QI dot. And this term cancels that term. And so what you're left with is DDT of QI, of the change in QI. So um, this dot can go to the other side. And so what we have then is this expression and that. And now if we look at what's in there, let me just say that what's in the, um, what's in the brackets here is uh, DDT of partial L partial QI change in, I'm sorry, QI dot change in QI because you differentiate this second term. If you differentiate here, let me suppose you differentiate this one, you get that term times that. But now you see, yeah, I, I, I think I went a little too fast here. Um, what am I, what am I? In fact, I think there may be a typo here. Um, so let's just go back to this. No, no, all we do is integrate by parts, the second term. Sorry, I, I, I made this more complicated. So forget this. Um, what we do here is we just integrate this thing by parts. And when we integrate it by parts, we just keep this term and integrating this by parts, we get minus d by dt here. And then um, we have this term left over. So in other words, it's, it's the, so I, I was right in writing this down because it's the time derivative of this that's equal to this minus that. All right. Anyway, um, so the principle of stationary action says that the classical process is the one that makes D delta S zero to first order. We're only working to first order, so we want thing to be zero um, for processes in which we don't change the endpoints. And so that means that the process has to satisfy Lagrange's equations. And, um, there's another uh, result that falls out here. Um, namely, if the Lagrangian does not depend explicitly on the time and the, the, the professional term for that is uh, that the system is autonomous, then the energy is conserved. And so let's see what, what that is. Well, the energy is this, the time derivative of that is, you take the derivative of this term and then the derivative of that term, you add them together, but now you use Lagrange's equations. And this thing gets replaced by that. And so you have partial L partial QI, QI dot, plus partial L partial QI dot, QI double dot minus, uh, L dot. And um, well, what is that? Well, that is 
the total this is the total derivative of L with respect to time. And so it's the partial derivative plus all these terms. And so these terms cancel and all you're left with is partial derivative. But you said that partial derivative vanishes. So then the energy's time derivative has to vanish. So the energy is conserved whenever the Lagrangian does not involve time. And um, in fact, in cosmology and general relativity, you can say, well, there's no time there in the end. There's no, you know, time uh, said uh, at, at uh, and uh, so there's no particular time in the formula. And so consequently for the, uh, the action, and consequently, um, you have energy conserved. Um, the momentum that's canonically conjugate to Q, of course, is this in general. And um, so the Hamiltonian uh, is then this expression. And again, you have to be able to write the QI dots as functions of Qs and Ps. Now, in most cases, you can do that very easily. Um, if you now ask for the change in the action for only, if you only change the, the endpoints, but you don't change the path, then what, what, what is the situation? Well, you go back to this equation uh, and what you have is that PI is partial or partial QI dot, and so the change here, actually, I should have said 163. So let me see if I can flash. Well, let's go back to 163. Now we've gone to 163. Okay, so what's the change in the action? Well, we're saying there's no change in the integral. There's just this change and only a T2 then it's the momentum times the change there. And so that gives you a formula, namely that, uh, let's see, where the hell was I? Yeah, partial S partial QI is PI. The total time derivative of the action is then uh, Lagrangian, which is the partial and then pa the, all these partial derivatives and um, that is then this partial plus uh, PI uh, QI dot. Um, all right, let me, something a little bit puzzling about that, so I'm not gonna dwell on that. Any event, apart from a minus sign, the derivative of the action is um, L, minus PIQI dot, or it's minus the Hamiltonian. Okay, we have plenty of time now, I think, to uh, cover something that's really important in physics, namely that uh, the relationship between symmetries and conserved quantities. Um, and so what is this uh, relationship? God, I, well, I think I'm just gonna leave it the way it is. Maybe switch to blue. So what's the relationship between uh, them? So first of all, let's consider a symmetry. Um, suppose you cha change QI to QI prime, and therefore you've changed QI dot, to QI prime dot that looks like this. It's a symmetry of the Lagrangian if the Lagrangian doesn't change. So partial L, partial QI, delta QI, partial L, partial QI dot, delta QI dot, all them added up, you get zero. Um, so let's take this symmetry then, assume delta L is equals zero. What does that tell us? And let's use uh, Lagrange's equations. And of course, Lagrange's equations are partial L partial QI is equal to DDT of partial L partial QI dot. 
And so this expression here then is that delta L, which is zero, this is a sum partial L partial QI delta QI plus partial L partial QI dot delta QI dot. What is that? Well, that is DDT of the sum of partial L partial QI dot change in QI. Now, why is that? Well, let me switch colors a little bit. When you differentiate the second term, you obviously get this one. When you have DDT on partial L partial QI dot, you get this. And so differentiating this term gives you this as long as you, here, let me, as long as you use also this. And so that means you have something conserved. And the thing that's conserved then is Q, which is the sum on I partial L partial QI dot change in QI, or it's the sum PI change in QI. So this is the thing that's conserved. And if you have n particles, it's sum i equals one to three n. Um, and this is conserved. Well, here's the detailed demonstration because DDT of this is DDT of the first term plus the second term. And um, the first term with Lagrange's equations gives you that. The second term is exactly that. And this vanishes um, by assumption. It doesn't in general vanish, it vanishes because we're saying that uh, this particular change in the QIs and the QI dots uh, leaves the Lagrangian exactly invariant. Um, so by the way, this thing here is that it changes uh, exactly there. And um, th this, I think this was, was um, this may have been first derived by a physicist known as Emmy Noether. Um, I think she was German or Austrian. Um, and she uh, came to the United States. I don't know, maybe it's possible she was born in Brooklyn, for all I know. But um, her name is vaguely German. She taught, I think, at Bryn Mawr or someplace like that. Anyway, um, she died in 1935. Um, she, I, I think she may have been the first person to point this out. I'm, I'm not sure. In any event, her name is attached to the conservation of momentum and angular momentum. And the idea is suppose the Lagrangian is unchanged by a spatial translation. In other words, you take everything and you move it a little bit. Well, then what's Q? Well, in this particular case then, Q is the sum of PI. And now you're moving everything the same way. So these PIs are three vectors, dot D, or equivalently, it's D dot sum on I PI. Well, this is D dot P. So the total momentum is unchanged if there's no change in the Lagrangian, Lagrangian when you displace it by D. Um, suppose now that it's, that the Lagrangian is unchanged if you rotate all the particles about some origin. 
or some axis actually. And the axis is parallel to theta actually. Um, then uh, what is uh, conserved? Well, what's conserved once again is uh, Q is the sum of PI change in QI. Now, uh, this is a sum PI. Well, what's the change in QI? Well, it's, it's theta cross QI summed. I'm so I'm going, I'm considering that the QIs are three vectors. And the picture here is, suppose this is the axis of rotation. You're rotating a particular particle around this axis, then um, the by an angle theta, theta, the vector theta is this direction. The mag length of theta is the amount of the rotation. And you just take theta crossed into the vector is like that, you see. So if the particle is here and this is the vector, then you have theta, suppose this is, so this is the axis rotation, this is the particle, this is the, this is the origin here. And you're going from the origin to here is R or Q. This is theta. Theta cross R is a vector in this direction, perpendicular to these two. And that's what happens with this. This one turns a little bit this way when you rotate it. Okay, so um, in this case then, uh, let me switch back to red. Uh, Q is a sum PI uh, theta cross QI, PI dot, theta cross QI. And now you know you can massage that because of the cyclicity of the, I mean, what this actually is, is a sum over I, J, and K of PI, Epsilon, I, J, K, Theta, J, Q, K. Um, Q, K. Uh, so there's, there's a, I, J, and K go from one to three, but we're summing over all the particles like that. And so we're also summing over the particles. And um, you can rewrite that so that um, this is some epsilon J, K, I, theta, J, P, alpha, P, no, Q, K, alpha, P I alpha. And so this is uh, theta crossed into um, a sum on alpha of um, Q cross P. And Q cross P summed over alpha, that's L. So this is theta, uh, actually it's theta dotted into that, isn't it? theta dot L, where this is the angular momentum. Okay, so um, anyway, if you've seen this um, before, then you're nodding your head and wondering why, why is he going so slowly? If you've not seen it before, um, work through these equations and make sure you can get from one equation to the other um, uh, in a sensible way, a satisfying way. Um, this is just something I played with. It's an extra example. Um, you can even have a Lagrangian that depends upon accelerations. Normally Lagrangian only depends upon position and, and velocity. If you add acceleration, you can still have but don't add the time, you can still have the, an energy that's conserved. Um, homogeneous first order, ordinary differential equations. Um, here, suppose that P and Q are homogeneous, uh, then of degree N, then um, you can take advantage of that because you can write Y as X times V, 
and then dy is x dv plus v dx. And um, so then you've got p of x and x v dx plus q of x x v, and then dy is x dv plus v dx. That's all equal to zero. Now it's homogeneous, so you pull out the x, you pull out the x, and now you have a much simpler equation. You cancel x to the n, and uh, well, you divide by x to the n plus one, and you get this equation, dx over x is dv times just a function of v. And then you integrate that and uh, you get a function v of x. This is v of x, there's x, and this is some number, um, function of the final, or v0 and v, you know. Anyways, so you get a solution, x, y of x is x, v of x. An example is um, if you have this differential equation, um, the coefficients are homogeneous of degree two. So you set y equal to xv. You get this expression, the x squared cancels. You've got that. You then separate, integrate, and you wind up with y as certain square root. Okay. Now, here is. Um, it's not the bottom line of everything, but it's something really important because it is a crank that you can turn. So this is a crank that you can turn. You can always turn it, it always works. And so this is something you want to know about. And what is the idea? Well, if you have a linear first order, ordinary differential equation, Turns out you can always integrate it because you can always find an integrating factor. So this is the idea is that it's linear and first order. So first order means dy dx. Linear means y occurs only uh, linearly in the derivative, linearly in the function, and then y to the zero over here. So we multiply by alpha and we say this is going to be, we declare that this is going to be um, uh, uh, exact. And so we say P is alpha R Y minus S DX. We multiply both sides by DX. And then plus uh, alpha DY, that's just left over from here. That's all equal to zero. So Q is alpha, P is alpha, ROI minus S. So the conditions for exactness is P sub Y, which is alpha R, is Q sub X, which is alpha sub X. But this is a nice tidy differential equation. It's alpha X over alpha is R. But alpha X over alpha is just um, D log, alpha, in other words, d log alpha dx, of course, is one over alpha d alpha dx. And so that's alpha x, or equivalently, it's alpha x over alpha. And you set that equal to r, so then you integrate. And when you integrate that equation, what you get is log alpha equals, um, well, alpha x equals r, so this is just the integral of r of x prime dx prime out to x. And that's this expression. Well, that's the log expression. You now exponentiate and you get alpha of x equals e to the integral x r of x prime dx prime. And that's this uh, equation here. And so now you can say, well, since alpha r is alpha sub x, the original equation multiplied by the integrating factor is just, al is just alpha y of x is plus alpha r y, and that's alpha y sub x plus alpha sub x y, that's 
the x derivative of alpha y, and that has to be alpha s. And so now we can integrate this and we get, this is saying d, d dx of alpha y is alpha s. And so we have to integrate alpha of x prime s prime, alpha s over x prime, and that gives us alpha y. Dividing by alpha, we get this, but we know what alpha is. And so we have a general solution. And the general solution is y of x is e to the minus the integral of r of x prime. That was the original r here. And then we multiply that times y of x zero plus, so that's this term. And then we have this term, one over out, this is one over alpha. And we have that in this integral, an alpha, of course, is this thing here. And um, that's this exponential. And um, uh, what I've left out is this guy has an alpha. Oh, we're dividing by alpha of x. So, so the, uh, the, this is alpha of x over x over alpha zero. So we've divided out an alpha zero everywhere. Okay, well, we're basically out of time. I, th I think because this is uh, a crank that one can turn and one really likes this, it's important. I'm gonna uh, redo this um, on Thursday. Uh, tomorrow I'll, um, is mainly questions but, um, or examples, and um, you can um, ask me to do examples and I'll try to do examples. Or, anyway, if you want me to do something exotic, uh, please um, let me know. That is to say, uh, send me an email telling me what you want to do that's a little bit, what do you want me to do that's a little exotic? Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing and everything. Um, uh, and